Uh, on the uh, presentation today, I'll begin with a background of the bridge, where the bridge type is located, of where the bridge is located. Talk just briefly about uh, just the bridge type selection process, and then uh, spend most of the presentation getting into the nitty gritty of uh, final design of the arches and modeling the bridge in Mita Civil. Depending on how much time we have towards the end, uh, talk a little bit about construction, and then we'll have time to field any questions you might want to ask. And uh, as has been the case in the past, any questions uh, I don't get to today during the presentation, uh, we'll uh, respond to subsequently via email. So question will be answered if you have it. In any case, uh, the Fulton Road Bridge Project, it's uh, located in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, just south of just south of downtown, right here, um, and uh, in a pretty culturally significant uh, area of town. Looking, uh, zooming in a little more on the project location, uh, the bridge crosses a valley in which the uh, Cleveland Metro Park Zoo is located. It also also crosses over two sets of active railroad tracks: uh, one CSX and one uh, Norfolk Southern. Looking at the bridge from the side, you can see that, uh, particularly for visitors to the uh, Cleveland Metro Park Zoo, it's a uh, it's a very visible structure. Here's uh, this is the part of the zoo where the uh, uh, I think that this is where the some of the tigers and bears are located over here. So uh, everyone going over here to the zoo gets a gets a really uh, close up view of this bridge, which uh, you know I appreciated too during my ten years at the Cleveland office for Baker before moving to Minnesota. Well, uh, the original bridge located at the site uh, was a cast-in-place uh, open spandrel concrete duck arch. It was uh, built in 1932, featured six 210-foot uh, arch spans, and had a lot of architectural detail, as you can see in this photo of the bridge shortly after it was open to traffic. Unfortunately, the uh, bridge was not maintained very well. Those uh, the, That nice cantilever we were uh, stuck in the previous uh, photo you saw was removed and the, the nice railing was, repl was replaced with just a chain link fence which then allowed water to flow over the edge of the bridge and start deteriorating the, and to deteriorate the spandrel columns and by the time uh, my the, 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 my supervisor Jeff Broadwater took me out to see the site during my uh, job interview with Baker back in uh, 2003, the bridge, uh, the original bridge was in a very advanced state of deterioration. I don't think I'd ever seen a uh, bridge concrete structure quite that deteriorated. And in fact, some of the uh, transverse diaphragms between the end piers were actually all the concrete, not just some of it, all the concrete was gone and there was only uh, a rebar cage just hanging in the air. And there were also, uh, as a result of all this deterioration, as you can imagine, there was a fair amount of falling and crumbling concrete, so uh, protective shelters were in, uh, installed under the bridge uh, for visitors to the zoo so that they didn't have any concrete all on them. Uh, Michael Baker International um, from the, uh, uh, was engaged by uh, Cuyahoga County Engineer's Office to uh, perform preliminary and final design for a replacement structure. There was a, a lot of community engagement. Talking with the community, there was uh, a fair, uh, there, was, there was a strong preference for an arch-like replacement structure. Uh, there had been uh, another arch cross, concrete arch crossing of the, the valley a little ways up that uh, previously had been replaced with just a steel plate girder structure, and uh, many people were still still sorry that it had been done and not replaced with another arch. So strong preference for a uh, con uh, arch structure, and as a result of the uh, during the preliminary design process, the uh, selected alternative was a uh, contemporary concrete arch bridge with uh, you know, a contemporary appearance, so not, not trying to mimic a historic 1930s structure, so a fewer spandrel columns along the length of each arch span, but still a actual concrete arch. Here's a, uh, kind of a, a, a diagram of the layout of the uh, selected replacement uh, structure. Still uh, like the original structure, the replacement structure has six 210-foot arch spans, concrete arch spans over the valley, uh, while uh, repla and uh, replacement structure has been uh, precast uh, eye girder, concrete eye girder approaches on each end. It's a continuous bridge from end to end. 
Uh, one innovative thing about it is the uh, it has a pre-stressed concrete. Uh, let me find here. It has a uh, pre-stressed concrete aggregator sur superstructure which floats atop uh, the six 210-foot arch spans on uh, bearings. So there's a single foot fixed point in the middle here, and then the superstructure is free to expand in either direction and sits on bearings on top of the spandrel columns and end piers. Uh, also other than this single fixed point in the center. There is a vertical crest curve on the bridge, so uh, water drains off the structure using the bike lanes. So no, the idea is then to keep all rainwater and any salt infested water from the wind, uh, from uh, removing snow off of the concrete of the bridge. So here's the uh, cross section of the bridge. The uh, Like the original structure, there are four uh, arch ribs. Um, Difference here, though, is these arch ribs and the replacement structure are precast concrete rather than cast in place. Uh, the spandrel frames, just due to the uh, due to the vertical curve on the bridge, all of the spandrel columns uh, are you know they're all slightly different heights. So the thought there was that precasting would not be an efficient means of constructing the uh, the spandrel columns and spandrel frames because everyone was a little different. So they're uh, cast in place over the arch ribs, and then the superstructure is a, a standard for Ohio uh, precast concrete auger I-beam superstructure supporting four traffic lanes, two bike lanes, and wide sidewalks on either side. So let's look at a uh, typical arch span. So each, uh, each arch rib and each span is made out of uh, three precast segments with their the two types of segments, the arch end segment and then the arch crown segment which are joined together with cast and place closure pores between the end segments and the end piers and uh, the end segment and the crown segment. The precast segments have uh, little pedestals here for then the, that then the uh, cast and place spandrel columns are cast on top of. And again, each uh, span, each arch span is 210 feet. So now let's get into a bit of the final design of the structure. I'll talk about the uh, post-tension requirements for the arches how to determine what the effect of length should be for slenderness effects, moment magnification, talk some, and then I'll talk some about uh, superstructure, substructure interaction uh, for this structure, because I thought it was a particularly interesting aspect of the design. Well, let's talk for a little bit in general terms just about arch behavior. I, it's just been from my experience, you know, reviewing models of arches, that sort of thing, that oftentimes people will just assume that the uh, boundary conditions for a fixed end arch should just be a fully fixed support at each end. Uh, as we saw in this project, though, the uh, the actual uh, boundary conditions of an arch, whether it's uh, founded on rock or on tall or more flexible piers, whether it are, and how flexible the foundation may be, have, uh, actually play a, a very large role in determining what the what the forces in an actual arch will be. Uh, often the, the actual boundary conditions are significantly more flexible than the assumption of just a fully fixed support at each end, and that additional flexibility then leads to uh, uh, often significantly higher bending moments in an arch than might be computed if you assume the uh, end conditions of an arch were fully fixed. Now, uh, I think traditionally when people think of an arch, you think of uh, an arch, or say arch action, structure acting like an arch as a uh, element that primarily takes force and axial compression, acting, acting, acting like an arch, and has relatively little bending. Uh, that, that condition, that sort of ideal arch behavior type of condition, is, uh, is, comes closest to being met if you do have fully fixed supports, the base of an arch, have an arch that follows the line of thrust where the uh, the dead load axial force coming in at each joint between a spandrel column and the arch then exactly adds in magnitude and direction to the resultant axial force in the arch below the joint. And for a uh, arch supporting just discreetly spaced spandrel columns, the line of thrust is a polygon, so it's not a smooth curve. So uh, this arch shown down here has the same span length as the actual arch at the Fulton Road Bridge. This, this condition here of an arch that is full on fixed supports, is a polygon between spandrel columns, and then doesn't have any kind of incremental construction sequence would come the closest to satisfying these conditions 
of an ideal theoretical arch where the load is just primarily carried by axial compression and there is little bending moment. However, as I mentioned, this type of ideal arch action is decreased by if the arch, de the actual profile of the arch deviates from the ideal line of thrust, if there are flexible piers and foundations that then the end conditions are not fully fixed, they're flexible, and if there's some type of incremental construction sequence, all of these factors will result in the load being carried by a, a higher proportion of bending moment and a lower proportion of axial force. So to look at this issue a little further, we, uh, we did just some general studies where we, we did model an arch. We, we considered like what considered it this ideal theoretical arch for one span of the bridge that had these ideal uh, fully fixed end conditions and an ideal profile following the line of thrust, loaded it with the actual dead load plus half span live load uh, from the, an actual arch line that the bridge would experience, and then looked at the internal stresses. Because uh, arches are, in terms of bending, are most sensitive to uh, asymmetrical loads, so an asymmetrical half span live load would tend to generate the largest bending moment. So then looking at the internal stresses, where here uh, compressive, actual compressive stress, is, or just compressive stress is uh, negative, see that for this ideal case, the, uh, the stress in, inside the arch rib is almost completely uh, compressive axial, in, in axial compression. So, this, so uh, this theoretical case is acting as a theoretical arch would, one would think it would act, carrying the load and it's basically complete axial compression. But then when we looked at the actual case of our actual bridge, where we have arches that, for aesthetic reasons, are curved between spandrel columns rather than being a polygon, and rest on tall piers on somewhat flexible foundations that are founded on shale. There's, uh, there's quite a bit more uh, tensile stress in this arch from the same loading as you'd have in, this, uh, in that ideal case I showed before, where the, these spikes in our, uh, all our uh, tensile stress here, uh, you can see it gets up to, you know, oh, this is just a service load of uh, positive, you know, 1 KSI, located in many cases near the joints of the segments is, uh, you know, traditionally high, is significantly higher than what you get with this ideal case. So uh, let's look at that, like, let's look at the actual versus uh, ideal case in terms of moments. So here's the moment diagram, there's a gray line for this ideal polygon case for the same span length and load, and load as an arch line in the actual structure. Well, the dark black line is the moment diagram for the same loading on the uh, same, on an uh, arch line of the actual bridge. You can see uh, bending moments are significantly higher for an arch of the actual structure versus this ideal arch case up here, so ideal up here, actual down there, uh, with uh, significant negative moments uh, near the ends of the arch. And the, I should add these are uh, fully fixed arches, no internal hinges, and then uh, significant positive moments that uh, reach their maximum where the spandrel columns frame in to the arch. And I don't want to get too into uh, too into the meaning of this graph here, but suffice it to say, as part of our design, we did a uh, sensitivity analysis to see uh, how how much introducing each uh, going from this theoretical case to the actual case of the arch had on uh, changing bending moments. You can see that this purple line, dashed purple line, that would be from this ideal polygon case, and then uh, we kept making the arch more and more flexible by making it closer and closer to the actual case where uh, we say instead of being polygonal, in red now it follows the parabolic curve, instead of being fully fixed at its base, now it's on tall piers on the blue line, then instead of uh, having the tall piers be fixed at their bases, they're on the actual, uh, they have the actual spring constants of the uh, spread footings on shale, the green line, and then uh, we incorporate moments based on the anticipated construction sequence, how it's sequentially erected rather than just all at once, and you get the total moment in the yellow line. So you can see that all of these, adding all of these parameters to the structural modeling of the bridge have quite a significant effect on bending moments. Like here in about the same location, we're at a moment of, I don't know, like a negative moment of about like, what would you say about, that's about negative 500 kip feet for the uh, ideal case, and then we're at a uh, negative 4,000 kip feet for the actual case. So this just goes to show if you're modeling and analyzing an arch, be, uh, be rigorous and careful uh, about how you do it. Don't just assume it's going to be fixed at its end unless it's, it truly is really fixed at its end because the boundary conditions for how an arch is modeled really have a tremendous effect on the uh, output forces you'll get from your modeling of the arch. 
So uh, given that we had these high bending moments and we're creating the arch out of precast segments, we since the segments were precast, joined together, we thought it'd be uh, appropriate to meet the uh, service uh, concrete service limit uh, limits prescribed in the Ashto code. But for a completely fixed end arch, that's a little easier said than done. So if you try to uh, just post tension the completed arch all at once, the uh, restraint of the fixed ends, the fixed bases, will then induce a, uh, a restraint moment, a, a, a restraint moment, a, a secondary pre-stressing moment that will uh, basically completely counteract any beneficial moment you could induce in the arch through pre-stressing. Now our uh, solution to this problem, however, was to uh, pre-stress the arch, uh, well, we'll post-tension the arch incrementally during the construction sequence to then lock in beneficial uh, pre-stress moments before the arch became fully fixed. Uh, so here's a little run-through of uh, the actual construction sequence and how the uh, post-tensioning uh, works, that we act, uh, that works that we ultimately designed. So begin by uh, casting uh, the thrust blocks, uh, the, the end periods in place. Uh, then we start by erecting the end precast segments on temporary towers. These uh, segments are shipped from the precaster without any internal uh, post tensioning. They're uh, robust enough for that for that to happen without them cracking. Then uh, closure pores are poured between the end segments and the pier base. And uh, two 19 strand post tensioning tendons are then tensioned from the pier base through the end segment. And because at the time these uh, tendons are tensioned, the uh, arch is not yet a fully fixed arch from end to end. It's able to uh, deform under the uh, under the load of this post tensioning, so we're able to lock in beneficial uh, moment opposite in sense to the uh, moment where the dead load moment we're trying to counteract by post tensioning the tendons before the arch becomes fully fixed and continuous. Uh, then the uh, crown segment arrives. It's been uh, post tensioned. Uh, at the uh, pre uh, pre casting yard uh, from end to end, and since the uh, this post tensioning is added before the crown segment is erected in the arch, beneficial moments from this uh, post tensioning are able to be induced in this arch segment because there's no restraint to its deformations under this post tensioning load as there would be if this post tensioning was applied once the segment was part of a fully fixed continuous arch. So that post tensioning for the crown segment is applied first. Then uh, the crown segments erected on the temporary towers. Uh, we uh, duct connections are made for our continuity tendons, which I'll talk about in a second. And then closure pores are cast between the crown segment and the end segment. Uh, next, once those closure pores have cured, we do stress uh, four 15-strand post-tensioning tendons end-to-end -end the arch bridge uh, for, uh, through the arch span for continuity, uh, because at this point the arch is fully fixed. All these tendons do is induce uh, compressive axial force. This is useful to counteract bending moments in the cast and place closure pores where there are no other tendons, and to just pull the whole arch together. But since at this point the arch is continuous, no uh, primary pre stressing moments are induced in these continuity tendons, and they have a symmetrical layout. So, with this post tensioning in place, uh, you saw before that for the actual arch we had uh, uh, stresses for, you know, service dead load plus a half span live load significantly above the uh, maximum allowable tensile stress pre prescribed by ASHTO. But with the post tensioning in place, stresses uh, are all uh, compressive, still you know, quite a bit above the maximum allowable compressive stress. So we, uh, our stresses are in a good place, so to speak, meeting the stress limits of ASHTO for a precast concrete structure. Now this, uh, see this again during construction, but our uh, Post tensioning uh, crosses over and overlaps in the pier base. The ducts cross over. You know, this was the most complex part of the structure to build, but it did uh, by, by having them cross over. It made the post tensioning operations a little easier since there was plenty of room to access the post tensioning tendons and to uh, jack them without the jack running into uh, any concrete portion of the bridge. So that's uh, you know, the post tensioning uh, design aspect of the arches and. Uh, Another aspect of the arch design I found pretty interesting was uh, thinking about which is what would be the uh, appropriate effective length Ashto K factor to use for an arch on tall piers. 
uh, so that we could do you know, moment magnification slenderness analysis. Because uh, the Ashto code, it, it, it specifies what it specifies effective length k factors for fixed end arches, but you know, as we saw from doing these these parametric studies, uh, an arch on tall piers is actually is you know, quite a bit more flexible than an extend arch, and you know, is silent on how to uh, how to factor that uh, additional flexibility in to uh, moment mag a moment magnification procedure. Well, uh, we found our solution from reviewing the literature for cast-in-place concrete arch bridges in the past. Uh, the sort of arch bridge we were designing, a multi-span viaduct on tall piers, really there uh, not too many arch bridges were designed with this with this form pri uh, you know after World War II. Most of them, uh, most of that type of uh, arch viaduct is uh, you know before World War II, before when uh, you know labor was cheaper and you know concrete was more expensive. So it's a you know it's a form that is uh, economical on materials, but more time intensive to build. And our our solution came from a, a book about elastic arch bridges written by one of the Preeminent uh, concrete arch bridge engineers of the 1920s and 1930s, uh, Connie McClellan, who is uh, well known for the many beautiful concrete arch bridges he designed on the coast of Oregon. His uh, book, uh, Elastic Arch Bridges from 1931, uh, describes a procedure, a general method you can use for analyzing a uh, multi span arch bridge structure on tall elastic piers where you can think of it. Each arch is just a single arch span that has some extended arch length down to a fixed support, which results in the same flexibility as if as the actual arch on tall piers. So we did some modeling and used that same approach to find out like what would the extended length of an arch be that a single span arch on fixed supports be that results in the same amount of deformation and flexibility as one actual arch span on tall piers under the same loadings. So we did that, determined what this extended arch rib length would be, uh, arch on fixed supports to uh, result in the same deformation, and then for our, our moment magnification, used that length with the same uh, effective length k factors would be prescribed by Ashto for a fixed arch on Fixed supports. We did some kind of, uh, comparisons with geometric second-order geometric nonlinear analysis, and they looked real close. So we felt we felt good about this method for our uh, moment magnification. We're we're happy we had uh, read to back in the past to uh, Connie McCullough's uh, text on the subject, which has a lot of other uh, really good stuff too. I'd recommend uh, finding this book, Elastic Arch Bridges, if you can. And um, since this bridge is made out of uh, precast segments, which are sequentially erected in post tension, in post -tension uh, to, to get the final state of uh, stresses in the arch rib and to get deformations, and for geometry control, we knew that uh, we needed to include time-dependent creep shrinkage and post-tensioning loss effects in our modeling, which we did. And these uh, deflections are uh, calculated, long-term downward deflections of the four uh, camber and superstructure support displacements, which I'll get into in just a second. And as part of our analysis, the structure was analyzed at each phase of the construction sequence at opening day and after creep and shrinkage effects at uh, dissipated at day 10,000. Now I want to talk a little bit about the interaction between the arch rib and the superstructure. As I mentioned earlier, the superstructure is continuous from end to end of the bridge and uh, rests on bearings on spandrel columns over the arch rib. Uh, because both the arch and the superstructure are continuous, as opposed to, say, the superstructure being simply supported between spandrel columns, this means that lab load distribution between the superstructure and the arch rib is proportional to the stiffness ratio between the two. Uh, it also means that for a continuous superstructure uh, supporting an arch, the uh, lab load moments are actually higher than for identical superstructure spans on fully fixed, unmoving support. So it was, an, it was uh, important to incorporate these higher uh, moments into our design. Now here's a, uh, a, lot, a maximum live load moment diagram for the superstructure in the arch. And you can see here, looking at the superstructure, that the moments get steadily bigger, these live load moments, as you get towards the center of the span. So your total live load moment is both a function of just the 
the live load moment in the individual span of the continuous superstructure between the spandrel columns and an overall moment that gets larger uh, towards the center over the, the full arch span and is largest then at, in the superstructure above the center of the arch span. So we can see that trend of the moments getting larger to the center. There are, uh, in addition to these higher live load moments towards the center of each arch span in the superstructure that we need to be concerned about, we also need to be concerned about uh, additional moments that are induced in this continuous superstructure through downward displacement, long-term downward displacements of the arches due to long-term creep and shrinkage. The, uh, let's see, the uh, light black line here just represents uh, arch superstructure uh, moments just due to the HS25 maximum truckload. Then uh, the, uh, well, oh, pardon me, the, uh, the, the light black line, that would be for a, a superstructure with the same span lengths but on fixed supports rather than the actual spandrel columns that are supported by a uh, somewhat flexible arch. And the black line, uh, the thick black line, represents the actual superstructure uh, moments due to the HS, maximum HS25 uh, live load. And you can see, as we saw in the previous slide, that these moments get larger towards uh, in the superstructure towards the center of each arch span versus if the uh, superstructure was on fixed, unyielding supports. Then we have additional moments due to, this is then uh, the live load moment plus, the, the light gray line is the live load moment plus uh, moments due to, at day, the moments at day 10,000 due to long-term downward deflection of the arch due to creep and shrinkage. So you have a, a sort of sinking support problem here which then induces additional uh, moments in the superstructure due to those long-term long downward displacements of the arch under creep and shrinkage, which then resulted in an even higher moment than you would have if, say, you didn't consider any of these effects and just analyzed the superstructure as being on fully fixed supports. That's the, so fully fixed supports, thin black line versus um, live load plus creep and shrinkage induced moments in the superstructure from downward displacement of the arch into gray lines. So quite a significant distant difference here and is something you need to consider in the design of the continuous superstructure on a concrete arch. Uh, so those the, those are the highlights of uh, the final design of the arch ribs. My, my role on this project was to participate in the final design of the arch ribs uh, myself. So always enjoy talking about that. And uh, to perform the final design, we modeled the bridge uh, using Midas Civil software. This was one of our uh, first projects using Midas Civil. Uh, we used a uh, 2D model for arch and superstructure for uh, uh, dead loads, live load plus impact, uh, creep shrinkage, post tensioning effects, and uh, thermal effects. Our 2D model used over 200 construction stages, while we used a uh, 3D model for wind load effects on the arches and superstructure, since that was more, uh, you know, transverse 3D behavior. So in our uh, our 2D construction stage model uh, included the post tensioning tendons. Here's just a one, one of many stages, step 38, uh, where uh, in this case, uh, post-tensioning tendons and plate, uh, post-tensioning tendons are shown uh, by the purple line here. Uh, and as this was a time-dependent analysis, it also included every dead load that was in place at the time, plus creep, shrinkage, post uh, primary and secondary post-tensioning effects, and uh, any losses, losses of force in the post-tensioning. We had a two separate 2D models of the arch ribs of the six uh, continuous span arch ribs. Uh, since uh, just due to the site conditions, there were differences in the uh, heights of the arch end piers. So this, as we saw before, these differences in height of the end piers create different stiffnesses at the end of the arches, which then created a different behavior in the adjacent arch spans in terms of how many, what, of uh, how much moment versus axial force there would be in. Each arch. So modeling two different arch spans with two different sets of 2D models captured those differences. So here we're just looking at one representative construction stage where uh, here this uh, seg end segment B has been hoisted and pinned to the pier base. Uh, support conditions are, are shown here, not shown. Are there are also uh, spring supports in here to represent the foundations, and the temporary supports are shown right there. We'll get into a little more detail about that, how to do this in just a second.
Uh, in terms of uh, setting up a construction stage analysis in MIDAS, uh, this webinar intended to be a tutorial that will tell you everything you need to do to just go right and do that, but I did want to hit some of the highlights of setting up that analysis. We did need to design, uh, define uh, you know, a compressive strength curve uh, for the concrete. We found the CEB FIP 1990 code. We also, uh, you know, following CEB FIP 1990, we had to um, define the appropriate creep parameters in MIDAS. And then we used the uh, time-dependent material link function to uh, associate each of the concrete materials with the appropriate creep and compressive strength functions that we had designed, that we had defined previously. Uh, MIDAS does have uh, wizards, that, that sort of thing, that can be useful in modeling different structure types. Uh, for the unique geometry of our structure, we, uh, we created the model by importing nodal coordinates into it uh, that, were determined in a, that were determined in an Excel spreadsheet using just a parabolic equation for the arch. We then uh, just then, using the graphical tools, just then manually connected these nodal coordinates to define the elements and, in, and input loads. So it was a, you can do this either by just importing the nodal co coordinates directly into the nodes table or by using the MIDAS MCT text file. It's really straightforward. So even if you have a structure such as this one that doesn't fit one of the preset wizards, you can, you can get the model going by just importing the nodes and connecting them with elements in, inside MIDAS real easily. Since uh, the arches are post-tension, we had to define uh, tendon paths and tendon profiles for each tendon. Uh, these coordinates, like the arch road tendons themselves, I mean, like the arch road node coordinates themselves, came out of Excel. We just imported them into the, uh, you know, the tendon profile generators of MIDAS. You have to uh, associate the elements in your model that the uh, tendon goes through, so, so MIDAS can apply it correctly. And MIDAS also has a useful function where once you have uh, all a tendon profile in place, you can then copy and translate the tendon profile, which is uh, real useful for, say, a uh, repetitive structure like this where you have six spans with the same tendon profile. So then you can just, once you get it right for one arch span, you can then, or whatever it is you're modeling, you can then just translate and copy it for uh, the other spans in this, this profile insertion point box right here is useful for that. I mentioned we were doing construction stage analysis. There's a, a construction stage generator box uh, you'll find in MIDAS, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail in just a second as well. So uh, let's, look, uh, let's look in a little more detail about how one sets up construction stages. Let's go back to uh, here's uh, construction step 38, which I showed earlier. There's nothing particularly si uh, significant about this construction stage. It's just I think a useful one to illustrate how uh, setting up a construction stage works. Uh, again, this is uh, representative of the condition where segment precast segment B here at the end has just been hoisted and placed on temporary supports and then pinned with a temporary connection to uh, the pier base at one end before the uh, concrete closure core has been cast between the end segment and the pier base. So. Looking at the model in a little more detail, here we have our temporary support that's modeled, analogous to these temporary support towers there. Here's segment B. Uh, we have a, a temporary pin connection to the pier base that's modeled with a beam end release in MIDAS shown by the green circle here. And we have an applied load due to the uh, pedestal that the spandrel column sits on, but that is not included in the self-weight of the segment B. We, uh, although the tendons of, uh, in this arch rib have not been, tended, have not been tensioned yet, this uh, this uh, profile shows uh, the tendons that will be placed uh, along the arch. So you can think of this at this point as a tendon duct. So looking at how uh, this step 38 is uh, set up in MIDAS, if we you know go back go back to our you know construction stage composer, go down to step 38, select that, and hit show, then the first uh, we'll see this compose construction stage menu here, and there. Uh, have three tabs that show you what's going on, the element boundary and the load tab. Uh, starting with the element tab, we can see that here uh, the element tab lets you activate or deactivate elements by element groups. So uh, looking at the tree menu in MIDAS, you know, you can form uh, element groups of, you know, any combinations of elements you like. You can group them together and give them a name. And then, uh, and then once you have these element groups, you can activate and deactivate them within uh, this composed construction stage. 
menu. One key piece of information here is that you can see we've associated an age with these elements of 90 days. Since we're doing a time-dependent analysis of creep and shrinkage, it's really important. You know, creep is the uh, long-term displacement of concrete under a sustained load. You know, shrinkage is the tendency of concrete to lose volume over time due to evaporation of the, the water that goes into the mix. And both of these effects, uh, creep and shrinkage, will result in you know, long-term deformations of uh, concrete elements. Now, if these uh, deformations are unrestrained, as in the case of a statically determinate structure, they don't result in any uh, additional you know, internal forces in the elements as taken as a whole. Since this is a, a fixed end arch, though, it's a highly indeterminate structure. And uh, any deformations then due to creep and shrinkage get restrained by the fixed end structure and then induce moments due to creep and shrinkage. So uh, we have to account for those. And since uh, the magnitude of creep, in, uh, of creep is uh, highest initially, you know, it has a kind of decreasing logarithmic curve here. We're uh, defining it how old the segment is when it first sees sustained load. So the older it is, the less creep, it, creep there will be due to these sustained loads, because most of the creep in concrete will happen when the concrete's very young. So we had a 90-day uh, aging requirement for these segments, uh, precast concrete segments, which is then reflected here in this 90-day age in our uh, composed construction stage dialog. Um, moving on to the boundary tab, as this uh, so, so here, back in the element tab, we've uh, activated the segment B at the end, shown by the uh, highlighted elements here. Going on to the boundary tab, we've uh, activated the uh, appropriate boundaries that are uh, activated in MIDAS at the time the segment is activated. Uh, this um, so-called span 5 construction uh, boundary condition gets activated. That's the uh, pin connection at its base through a beam end release. And also the span 5 temp support B gets activated. That's the temporary support located at the top end of segment B. Uh, these boundaries are uh, boundary groups, like the elements they're groups, but a different type of group, a boundary group that is defined uh, whenever, you, uh, whenever you define a boundary condition in MIDAS, such as a support or a beam end release or an elastic link. At the time you do so, you have the option to associate the boundary condition with a boundary group, which then you can view in the tree menu under the works that you can then view in the tree menu under the group tab, which is uh, what we did here for all these boundary conditions. So you can, just like the element groups, you can activate and deactivate them at different points over the course of the construction stage. So here you can see we're activating this uh, beam element release to have a pin, temporary pin condition at the base of this arch segment and then a temporary support at its top. The third tab of the uh, construction stage uh, composition tool is to uh, add uh, loads that are activated during the construction stage. Here we, uh, so we added all our dead loads uh, over the course of our construction stage model. Here you can see just uh, our applied dead load due to uh, this little pedestal on top of uh, seg the end segment B uh, to support the spandrel column. Uh, like, uh, like the others, you group these, uh, and it, as you're applying load during the construction stage, you all the applied loads should be grouped into appropriate load groups, which then you can view in the works tree. So here we can see we have an active load group of this, you know, segment 5B spandrel cap, uh, or spandrel pedestal self weight. So you know, pretty easy to use. It's a it's a real nice way of uh, introducing construction stages. I find it. I'm, Oh, ever, ever since this project and, and then too, I found it very user-friendly. Well, moving on to our live load analysis, uh, we used the lever world to come up with distribution factors for how much of the uh, superstructure live load each arch rib sees. As prescribed by the client, we used an HS25 loading with uh, the lever rule that enabled us to use a 2D analysis for live load where we uh, defined a line lane over the length of the superstructure, where we then we use the appropriate boundary conditions between the superstructure and the spandrel columns. Uh, looking at, say, how we set up a moving load case to run on this line lane, here's just the HS20 truck. That's a, a preset vehicle in Midas. Since uh, we're using an HS25 loading, we scaled that up, 1.25. And then the scale factor, manual scale factor, we typed in up here, 1.91. This is the distribution factor that we obtained using the lever rule. 
I know for uh, wind loads, as I mentioned previously, since uh, this creates transverse bending in the arch rib, spandrel columns and spandrel caps, we used a uh, 3D model to determine these wind loadings, but uh, our approach here of 2D for dead loads and live loads, since so those are primary vertical loads, and then 3D for wind loads, uh, this was a pretty simplistic way to go. We thought it would have been a lot more complicated with a lot of, of more additional analysis and modeling time to build up that construction stage model in 3D. And since uh, each uh, arch end pier is, uh, you know, they're all self-supporting, there isn't a lot of interaction between the arches, so this we, we felt and you know, did some study with our 3D model here just to confirm, but uh, the, the 2D model was a, was a good way to go. So uh, now that we, we had the bridge modeled in MIDAS, we uh, used the output from the model uh, in, in spreadsheets, which we wrote to perform the AXTO service limit state checks for the arch ribs. Uh, we did strength check of the arch rib for axial compression and bending using the forces output from MIDAS in conjunction with the PCA column program. Again, we, we used a uh, spreadsheet for shear strength check of the arches and then strut and tie analysis for the uh, uh, post tension anchorage zone in the arch segments themselves and the pier bases. Uh, just to see real quickly how you can get forces, output forces from Midas Civil during construction stages. If you look at the top left, this is for Midas 2015, you can see the dialog box where you, allow, where you uh, specify what construction stage we're looking at. Here we have it on step 38. Uh, once you've done that, then you can go to uh, under the results tab and then results tables. If you bring up uh, B results tables, you'll see this dialog box. You can specify the elements you want results for under structure group here. Specify the elements in the structure group you want to see. Uh, then you can select which loads you want. So say in this example, we're looking at dead load, looking at tendon primary forces. These are, pre these are the primary pre-stressing moments, just uh, pre-stressing axial force times eccentricity from the centroid primary force. Also, minus will for indeterminate structures compute uh, secondary pre-stressing forces. These are forces due to restraint of deformations on the structure uh, from the primary uh, post-tensioning. Just restraint of deformations from the post-tensioning gives us uh, tendon secondary forces. And then the creep and shrinkage forces you want are creep secondary and shrinkage secondary. You also have the uh, summation option, which will give you everything. Uh, and then you can, over here, if you already have the model set to the construction stage you're looking at, you'll have the stage you're looking at automatically selected, step 38 in our example case here. And then here you can select whether you uh, the uh, part of the element you're looking for results. The ends are part I and J, and then you can look in the middle if you want to. Our uh, element lines were quite short, so uh, we didn't need to, just need to look at parts I and J. And then uh, once you, you hit OK, then uh, up comes a results table listing, you know, for each element, axial forces, shears, and moments that you can then just copy and paste the forces from this table into, say, an Excel spreadsheet or other standalone document you have to do your uh, code checks. So that's uh, covers design. Looks like we have a uh, little time left to talk about construction. Uh, this project was uh, was bid in 2006, which is, uh, you may remember this was, uh, we, we hadn't quite hit the, uh, the housing bubble had not been burst yet, so uh, this was a time when there were rapidly escalating bid prices, and uh, we had uh, really our pencils to try to come up with what a, a reasonable engineer's estimate would be. Uh, we'd chosen... Uh, just a general structure type that we thought would be quite, uh, you know, constructible for Ohio-based contractors, and we were rewarded with a load bid that came in under the engineer's estimate. The low bidder was a Kikosing Construction Company, who was a, a pleasure to work with. Uh, the Ohio Department of Transportation provided uh, oversight during the construction process. The bridge is uh, ultimately owned by the Cuyahoga County engineer. So uh, the construction project began with uh, demolition of the existing bridge. Uh, the superstructure of the, exist of the uh, original bridge was uh, just removed manually, but then explosives were used to demolish the six arch spans. Uh, the arch pier thrust blocks—I mentioned those earlier, but we've done a lot. We've done a lot of uh, we've done some integrated 3D CAD modeling to make sure that our uh, 
design plans for this uh, you know congested region were correct and didn't have any rebar conflicts and although you know there was a bit of a learning curve associated with uh, forming and placing these uh, these elements uh, ultimately the, the contractor became uh, pretty fast at them and it really really wasn't too much of a hindrance project to have this uh, you know somewhat uh, complex region uh, the uh, Arch segments were pre-gassed and uh, fabricated by uh, Car Concrete in West Virginia. There were 72 segments in total of uh, two unique shapes, each is approximately uh, 60 feet long. You can see here, uh, just to reduce their weight, we used uh, internal styrofoam voids. So in some respects, they were you know, not you know, a little more complex, but not too different than um, the sort of pre-cast uh, box beams that are uh, commonly used uh, for bridges in, say, uh, you know, Ohio. Pennsylvania, so it was nothing too, not, nothing too new and different for uh, local precasters and contractors. Uh, the uh, arch segments were erected on temporary steel vents uh, towers. We saw some of those a little earlier. Uh, the towers took some more sort of unique, special forms to uh, get over the uh, the railroad tracks without obstructing rail traffic, and to get over a uh, historic bridge that the uh, new and old uh, bridge this crossover in the zoo. Between, I mentioned that there were closure pores between the arch segments. They were uh, one foot six inches in length. Uh, you know, some pretty congested rebar in there. And uh, for the continuity tendons, uh, duct connections need to be made between the continuity tendons in the closure pore. And as I mentioned, there were uh, four of these per each arch line. Uh, the post tensioning. Uh, was either uh, for the uh, crown segment, the crown segment PT that was done before the crown segments were installed, uh, for the end segment post tensioning and the continuity tendons, those were all jacked from the uh, base of the end piers. So the um, DSI's post tensioning contractor, they uh, were able to have like large unobstructed uh, work platforms to work from for the post tensioning operations. The uh, pre-stressed I-beam superstructure it was a 35 span, is a 35 span continuous superstructure consisting of ASHTO type 3 beams fabricated by pre-stressed services. And all these uh, beams sit on either elastomeric or Teflon sliding bearings as they get farther from the fixed point at the center of the bridge, giving 630 total bearings. And the superstructure had some uh, nice unique details too, such as this uh, tumular steel uh, arch themed railing, um, shot painted with field touch-up, and um, so that's a, that's a real short version of construction. It was interesting, uh, we had a fun time looking back uh, at the Cleveland State University archives of how uh, the original structure was opened. There were a, a number of festivities, this was no doubt a uh, bright spot during the, the Great Depression for the neighborhood residents. Here is a photo of a beer wagon float in the 19... 32 parade when the original bridge was finished. These all the folks here look like they're having quite a having quite a good time uh, for the bridge opening in uh, summer 2010. For the new structure, I, yeah, I think it's safe to say the uh, new structure opening festivities were a little more restrained. It was a, a fun run in June before the bridge was opened to the public. Then uh, ribbon cutting, official ribbon cutting in July, followed by a parade of classic cars and. Uh, Here's uh, photos of the original uh, bridge design team. This was taken in 1931. Then on, uh, during the opening day festivities, here's a portion of the new bridge design team. The center there, that's Jeff Broadwater. He's the uh, project manager, doing a great job. Not shown, uh, John Dietrich now, Baker's uh, national director for the bridge and highway practice, was instrumental in the uh, preliminary and final design of the bridge. As well, uh, Mike Bittner, Chris Cummings, uh, Ken Geis worked on the structure quite a bit as well. Uh, so in did a lot of the uh, environmental work that allowed the project to proceed. Uh, so in, in the intervening time between 1931, I think that this picture is reflective in general of our you know change, changes for the best in the, the engineering profession. Although uh, I guess uh, you know white white shirt and tie never goes out of style. Uh, so uh, th thanks a lot for attending. Uh, ho hope you enjoyed. Uh, hope you enjoyed the webinar. Just wanted to share.
material is uh, accurate. And uh, now I'd be happy to take questions. And I think Midas is going to take it back. But before they do, I just want to note how, uh, remember how I talked about how the foreclosure forest for arch span? If you look here, you can't see where they are at all. So uh, uh, the Kosing did a, uh, you know, they did a great job project. You can't see where these closure pores are. I also want to thank uh, Greg Cronsting and the Ohio Department of Transportation did a great job with the uh, construction oversight. And uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll take any questions we have time to answer. I, I believe Minus is going to take back the screen and show the questions. Yes, thank you, Daniel. Um, taking back the screen here, and we're going to address some of the questions that our attendees have submitted. And so the first question that we're going to address here, uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, you mentioned continuity post-tensioning would induce only axial force on the arch rib. Can you explain why there will be no induced moments? Um, well, for two reasons. Probably the most basic is that are the uh, post-tensioning, the profile that we chose for continuity post-tensioning is symmetrical about each axis of the arch, so there's no net uh, P, there's no net eccentricity for the continuity post tensioning, so that induces no moment. Uh, second reason is that if if there was a net, ex, net eccentricity, there might be some net moment that was induced. But what we were seeing in our studies is that the fixity of having a fixed end arch is that any uh, primary post tensioning moment just to axial force P times eccentricity E was almost completely counteracted by a secondary uh, post-tensioning moment just due to the restraint of the arch at its end. So any bending that, like, any uh, beneficial deformation that the uh, eccentric post-tensioning would induce in the arch was then uh, counteracted by a restraint to this beneficial deformation from the fixed end of the arch, which is why we then we're able to induce uh, post beneficial uh, primary pre-stressing moments in the arch rib by that staged post-tensioning sequence I showed before the arch became fully fixed and continuous for that band. Thank you. And the second question we want to address is the Elastic Arch Bridges book is useful to understand the theory in general. I am not sure why it was needed if a numerical solution can be gotten from Midas. Can you clarify, please? Sure. Uh, the, well, the aspect of design, we were uh, we used uh, some tips from the Elastic Arch Bridge where we're uh, incorporating slenderness effects or just through ash show moment magnification. And as part of uh, following those procedures, you need to, uh, there's a, a KL term in there, you need to say what the effective length of the arch rib is for the purposes of the calculations. And that, uh, that K factor, the effective length factor, tells you what by you know what factor to multiply the half span arc length of the arch by now those uh, effective length factors which then describes how you know, truly flexible the arch rib is for the purposes of uh, the slenderness effects now for a arch that's fully fixed at its base uh, ash specifies what that k factor should be but it doesn't specify what it should be for an arch on tall flexible piers which was the uh, case for our arch here. So uh, what, what we got out of that 1930s text was the idea that you can uh, uh, figure out what that value should be by modeling a single span uh, longer arch rib length and extended arch that's on fully fixed piers, which has the same flexibility as the actual as an actual shorter arch span on tall flexible piers. So once you found that actual longer extended arch span on fixed piers, we know what the effective length k factor for that extended arc what, for what a fully fixed pier should be. So we can use the specified effective length k factor for a fully fixed pier in conjunction with an, a, a longer uh, half uh, half arch um, half arch rib length from the extended arch in the you know KL over R equations for moment. Thank you, Daniel. And the third question is, what was the construction stage model used to account for actual durations, cure times, et cetera, to monitor conclusions determined during design? Uh, we did we did do some updating. Like We assumed that the construction stage would be, uh, construction would go from uh, the, 
end-to-end, -end, but the, uh, it actually proceeded in the opposite direction from the, uh, and we assumed, but we compared uh, our results to uh, an independent analysis, time-dependent analysis performed by the construction engineer, James and the Spons, using uh, their uh, Bruco software, and we got a very similar numbers in terms of what the uh, long term, what the uh, deformations of the arches due to creep and shrinkage would be at different period uh, times of the design, which uh, made us feel good. That's good. <laughs> uh, how was the torsion in arches captured in 2D models? We, uh, we did a number of studies using our uh, 3D model to uh, kind of calibrate how asymmetrical, you know, torsion loads placed on the uh, R trib would induce uh, torsion in the 2D R trib. So we had a, so so that gave us a method to then you know take uh, a 2D force and then add you know uh, determine what a applied uh, additional torsion would be just based on the axial force and the arch. So we did that by uh, you know, studying applied, specific applied loads in the 3D model and then calibrating our 2D model to reflect those torsion effects. So our ultimate uh, uh, design for the, the shear stirrups and, and the arch was, a, in fact, a combined shear and torsion design uh, where you know those, those stirrups and longitudinal mild steel were designed for the effects of uh, combined shear and torsion. All right, and I think uh, we're just going to address some of these uh, construction-related uh, questions, and we'll wrap things up. But uh, number five, did the contra contractor propose a different construction stage? Uh, well, as I, as I mentioned just uh, a little earlier, they uh, they proposed to erect the bridge in an opposite direction from the direction we assumed for design. But our uh, our idea that the bridge would be uh, erected on temporary towers ended up being the direction they went as well. So. Uh, you know, although the particular of the railroad tracks, you know, maybe the placement of the towers was a little, the specific of the towers was a little different, and the direction was different. The uh, the overall method of how the bridge was erected was uh, similar to what we assumed in our modeling. And one of our viewers would like to know if there were any lessons uh, that were learned from the construction. Oh, I'm sure there were a number of them. I'll, uh, I'll have to. Refresh my memory. I think uh, I think I'm probably just in you know some of the specification writing for um, concrete and uh, you know time between uh, allowable pours at the at the precaster. Uh, there, uh, like it, I mean the design seemed to the design proceeded uh, relatively smoothly. Probably the largest hiccup is. Uh, there was some uh, asbestos-based tile uh, used in the original structure, which had not been reflected, which had, was not, for whatever reason, shown on the uh, design plans of the original structure from the 1930s. And when that was uh, discovered, there was a, a slight delay in the project. So I, probably the largest lesson I, I learned in this, or in the project team learned, was uh, if you have an old structure, even if there's uh, no, say, old concrete structure, even if there's no uh, potentially hazardous material shown on the original design drawings, do some uh, cores in different locations to, to look for it anyway. Oh, no, that's that's uh, that's really good uh, advice there, Daniel. And uh, I think that we're going to wrap things up as far as the Q&A. And I just want to thank you again, Daniel. It's uh, it's been a pleasure working with you myself, and I think I can speak on behalf of Midas that it's uh, really great collaborating with you. And so thank you again. Okay, thanks. Thanks again for inviting me. Hope everyone enjoyed the webinar. All right, Daniel. Thank you. All right, we're gonna wrap things up here, and just a few things that I'd like to just share. Uh, Midas Civil. Uh, Again, it's a complete integrated bridge solution with full 3D FVA capabilities, optimized for bridge engineering, but capable of handling general structures. Midas Civil can handle both superstructure and substructure, as well as steel and concrete bridges.